Good morning, students, and welcome to this lecture on the odes of Keats. I have with me the guest speaker, Dr. Indira Nitya Nandam, who is the principal of S R Mehta Arts College, Ahmedabad. Indira, welcome to the studio, ma'am. Indira, ma'am, is an expert on several fields in English lit literature, and today she will be dealing with the odes of Keats. John Keats lived. for only 25 years and 4 months but his literary achievement is extraordinary his literary career expanded for only 4 uh, 5 years a little more than 5 years and it is said that three of his greatest odes that is ode to a nightingale ode to melancholy and ode on a grecian urn were written in a single month time gave him little but talent gave him much and and keats could achieve and contribute to literature so much that he has earned for himself a place amongst the literary greats of english literature his greatest contribution and achievement lies in this that he could combine the most complex of themes in the most simplest of poems from psyche's bower to the nightingale's glade to the warmth luxury of ode to autumn keats has produced some of the best poetry in the most beautiful of languages ma'am could you kindly tell us more on john keats please thank you namita it is said of keats that if he wrote only his odes and had not written anything else his contribution to english literature would have still been the same mm -hmm. and i'm happy that we're going to be talking about the odes of keats but before we do that can we have slide number 1 please before we do that let us look at the years in which he lived 1795 to 1821 as namita just mentioned just 25 years and even within those 25 years his writing career was only about 6 years Oh, for a life of sensation than of thoughts," he said. Next slide, please. When we look at Keats, the young Keats, look at the picture. You can see the young man, and the lines there. Some of you, my dear students, might recall that this is from a famous poem by Keats, not an ode, but very well known, "La Belle Dame Sans Merci." I see a lily on thy brow with anguish moist and fever dew and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast withereth too Do we need to know about the life of a poet before we can really appreciate his poetry any writer for that matter My dear students I think for some writers it may not be important but for some others it might be very important When you look at the odes you might ask yourself why should there be so much of sorrow in the life of such a young man and therefore in order to understand the poet keats i think you should know something about his life maybe some of you know that his parents died young maybe some still others know that he was very attached to his elder brother george and georgina they decided to migrate to australia and remember we are talking about the romantic age when there were no supersonic jets which could take you from england to australia it would be about 6 months before a letter reached them and they migrated to australia you then have his younger sister fanny keats they were orphans and they needed guardians there was no guardian who was willing to take on both of them and therefore they found different families to live with he had a younger brother tom keats very attached to john both of them john and tom keats and imagine what happened to tom keats thomas keats what happened to him he had tuberculosis tb as we call it and in those days the disease was fatal not any more my dear students but in those days there was no cure john sat by his brother his bedside treating him taking care of him but nothing helped and very soon tom keats died of tuberculosis 
Imagine, my dear students, soon after that, John Keats, our dear poet, realized that he himself was suffering from tuberculosis. The day, same disease which had taken the life of his brother had now attacked him. And that was not the end of his problems. He was in love with Fanny Brown, not to be confused with a sister, Fanny Keats, Fanny Brown. They were in love with each other, but for whatever reason, when Fanny Brown realized that Keats, our poet, was suffering from tuberculosis and that it was a fatal disease, she decided to part ways with him. That, my dear students, is not the end of his sorrows. His poem, Endymion, was published, one of his long poems. And just imagine, just imagine, it was torn to pieces by reviewers. Poor Keats had his cup full of sorrows. And that is why you can probably understand the kind of poetry that he wrote, especially when we look at the odes. Which age did he live in? All of you certainly know that he lived in the Romantic Age. The Romantic Age, which begins in 1798. Some of you might be wondering, why 1798? Why not 1800? But I'm sure many of you know the answer, because that was the year in which the lyrical ballads were published by Wordsworth and Coleridge. And undoubtedly, it is the lyrical ballads and later the preface to the lyrical ballads which set into motion the Romantic Age. The Romantic Age, in total contrast to the neoclassical age which preceded it, moved from the drawing rooms into the world of nature, moved from the importance of manner and style to matter, moved from classicism or neoclassicism to romanticism, moved from the reality, social reality, to the world of imagination, moved from drawing room, artificial life of upper class society to the world of nature, the trees and plants, the birds and beasts, the beauty of nature, appealed and inspired our romantic writers. What about the attitude? From objectivity, they moved to subjectivity. What happens when writers write from their heart? What happens when writers write what they feel? What happens when writers write subjectively? Their language is the language of the common man. Their language is no longer the artificial language. Their language no more gives importance to just meter or to rhyme. This was the kind of poetry that the major writers of the Romantic Age wrote. Who were the major writers? Next slide, please. Who were the major writers of this period? William Wordsworth. What are the poems that you think of? You think of Tintern Abbey? You think of the Immortality Ode? You think of the Prelude? You think of his pantheism? You think of his love for nature, nature which was also his guide, nature which was his guardian. The next poet, and equally important, because you think of Coleridge also as a critic, you think of his Biographia Literaria, where he spelt out very clearly all that Romanticism meant to these poets. You think of an unfinished poem like Kubla Khan. You think of the rhyme of the ancient mariner. You think of Christabel, you think of supernatural, so much of the supernatural. And then, of course, you have John Keats, about whom we are going to talk in detail. Along with Keats, you have to think of Shelley. Shelley, who wrote the famous elegy on the death of Keats, called Adonis. Shelley, who sang of the west wind and the skylark, the great lyric, lyric poet of the period. You think of Shelley because he talked about our saddest songs. And you think of Shelley also because he too died young along with Keats. Shelley is important because of Prometheus Unbound, the romantic spirit of liberty, the romantic spirit of independence. Imagine fighting with the gods to bring down to earth fire. That is what Prometheus stands for. We also need to look at Lord Byron. And remember, Charles Lamb and William Hazlitt. 
the development of the personal essay, so important a characteristic feature of the romantic page. What are the characteristics of the poetry of Keats? I would like to suggest that in Keats's poetry, you find contrasts, you find paradoxes, you find binary oppositions. And what are these? Something which the young poet felt. Art is long, art is eternal, he wanted to believe. But at the same time, he was constantly troubled, worried by the feeling of the transience of everything. Whether it is love, whether it is passion, whether it is beauty, to Keats, they all seemed so transient. He knew that he had to live in the world of reality. Slide, please. He knew that he had to live in the world of reality, but constantly he wanted to dream. He wanted to escape, as our odes will show us later. He wanted to escape into the world of nature. He wanted to escape into the world of art. He wanted to forget the pain that was so much a part of this reality. Can you then be surprised that melancholy and joy? You know, students, it almost sign, sounds like an oxymoron when you place these things next to each other. But this was the truth about Keats's life. If there was joy, there was melancholy. If there was melancholy, there was joy. He was constantly contrasting the ideal with the real. What is the kind of life that he wanted to live? And what was a life that he was forced to live? A life of sorrow, pain, where he says, youth dies young, but age continues to live. Ma'am, if I um, just may interrupt here, death has always been a recurring theme. Yes. But then so has beauty in Keats's poetry. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, I mean, the, uh, the death of Tom was playing on his mind. Absolutely. He himself was suffering from tuberculosis. In fact, it's really sad that several writers were lost to this disease. Absolutely. The, I'm reminded of the Bronte sisters, mm -hmm. our own Toru Dutt. Absolutely. Shira, much later, a hundred years later. later. 100. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness, like, uh, that is not a, an issue today. But yes, referring, going back to Keats, I do feel that death is always there. Uh, even not just in his odes, but also in La Belle Dame Sans Merci. The, uh, the beautiful woman, yet she represents death. Mm. And yes. um, of course, uh, there is beauty in his poetry. But yes, the melancholic note is, is very much evident. Namita, I agree with you. And I'm sure, my dear students, you would agree that for somebody so young who had seen so much of death around him, yes. Namita, I would say the death of his parents to yes. begin with, Often right? And then, young. of course, the death of his younger brother. Mm -hmm. And the fact that medicine could not save you, that the best care and love that Tom could give, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, John could give Tom, mm -hmm. yet did not survive. You're absolutely right. This is what he saw around him. And yet there was this note of hope, shall I say, Shall I call it optimism? Yes. That even in the face of this continuous death around him, mm -hmm. he still is able to look right. at life certainly. as something. Uh, certainly the mortal and the immortal, for example. You know, you find that in his poems. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to capture the immortal in the mortal, yes. if I can put it that way. I think that's, that's, that's very important mm -hmm. in uh, most of Keats's poems. Uh, yes, because I think death and life to him, uh, a very thin line, or to anyone for that matter, mm -hmm. there's a very thin line um, demarcating, you know, the area of death and the area of life. Mm -hmm. And when one is seeing death so closely, I think it makes a difference, and therefore you mm -hmm. see it in this young person. Sometimes I wonder how such a young person, like John Keats, you know, hardly 25, uh, something the way our students are, you know, that age almost, or just a few years older, older. how he could fulfill so deeply. And then, Namita, I'm tempted to say that this is also probably because the experiences were so much more. You know, when you experience more, I yeah. guess you feel more. Mm -hmm. uh, when you feel more, you think more. Or I don't know, if you think more, you feel more. I don't know what comes first. But in the case of Keats, certainly, I would never say that he was a philosopher. You know, he, he, he lived life to the full. And that is what comes across in all his uh, poems. Mm -hmm. So I would say you could have death in life, 
You could have mortality and immortality. You could have the desire to connect with life. And in contrast to that, you could have separation. You know, if you put these uh, binaries together, you see why and how his poems become so great. That you could have both these existing simultaneously. You know, being held by passion, but yet a desire to escape. Because he says beauty dies young. Yes. So if beauty goes, is going to die young, do you need to be able to get out of it? Or should you continue? But the same poet could sing, a thing of beauty is a joy, joy forever. forever. The famous Endymion begins with these lines. So sometimes it's very, very difficult, you know, to understand how a poet at this young age could feel uh, so, so much. much. I would go on to some of his characteristics, other characteristics, which are related to him as a romantic writer. Next slide, please. These are the common characteristics of all the romantic poets. And you find them in Keats also. Uh, love of nature, love of beauty, right? You find it in every romantic poet. The importance of imagination, you know, to fly on the wingless, right, of poesy. Of poesy. To be able to fly is important. Sensuousness, you know, is, uh, is a characteristic of romantic poetry. But I would say it's more a characteristic of Keats's poetry. My dear students, all of you know of the five senses. And when you consider the importance of the senses, most of you might immediately say that sight or eyes are the most important. Because most of our experiences are through sight. You look at a beautiful object and the poet describes it. You're absolutely right. But when we come to Keats's poetry, I want to tell you that it seems as if all the five senses are equally important. Think of those lines where he describes the beauty of sound. Think of a poem, which I'll come to later, the nightingale, O to a nightingale, where he says, I cannot see, but I can smell. And therefore I know which flower is blooming where. Think of the beautiful flowers that you know, my dear students. Maybe not the flowers that Keats saw in England. But think of the flowers that you know. Shut your eyes and try to imagine the Mogra or the Rajini Kanda or the Ratki Rani or the Madhu Malti. I'm talking of flowers that we find in Gujarat. And therefore all of you will immediately be able to understand the kind of smells that I'm talking about. Shut your eyes and imagine what Keats must have felt when in the middle of the night he says he's wandering and he does not know which flowers they are because he cannot see. Because it is dark, remember, he cannot see. But yet he can smell by the fragrance and therefore smell becomes equally important. The song of the nightingale and therefore these ear, the ear or hearing becomes important. Think of touching, think of feeling, think of the tactile, you know, satin-like quality of the flower. So that is equally important. And taste, when he talks of the blushful hypocrite, when he talks of the, the wine that is brought from the warm south. Remember, he's thinking of Italy. He's thinking of Europe, where some parts of the Mediterranean coast are certainly warmer than the kind of cold weather that Keats is used to in England. So he talks about, and some of his lines are so beautiful, when he talks about bubbles winking at the brim. Think of a bottle of any drink, not wine, but any drink, my dear students. And think of how you have bubbles, any drink with a little fizz, and you see the bubbles. You see the bubbles coming, and you see the bubbles disappearing. But to the great poet Keats, they were bubbles winking at the brim. What a beautiful picture of a very ordinary sight. This is the kind of sensuousness that we see again and again in the poetry of Keats. No wonder we call him a great poet. The next quality, which is characteristic of all of Keats's poetry, is his ability for imagery. Slide, please. The lyrical quality is combined with the imagery, the metaphors and similes, and the symbolism. They all come together. We must read some of the longer poems. We must look at poems like Endymion, 
and poems like Hyperion maybe in order to understand. Because along with this, I would like you to know a word, Hellenism. Maybe some of you have come across the word. Probably the word medievalism when we think of a poem like the Eve of St. Agnes. And of course, a word like Hellenism. The Greek influence, right? Helen, double L, H E L L E N I S M. Not to be confused with Helen of Troy, though she is an important character when we think of the Iliad. But when we talk of Hellenism, we are talking of the influence of Greek art and sculpture on Keats. More of it when we discuss the Grecian urn in detail. Ma'am, if I may interrupt yes, here. Yes, Namita. Uh, don't you think that sometimes Keats, Keats as well as all the romantics are difficult to understand because of the Greek references, the mythological references? Uh, yes, you are absolutely right, Namita. But I think in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, in England, mm -hmm. the period that we are talking about, right, the Romantic Age, mm -hmm. I think people did not even consider Europe, you know, European art and alien literature, to them. alien to them. Yes. You know, it's like saying, uh, it's like saying, shall I say a Hindi word, but we have the same word in Sanskrit, yes. you know, because, yes. because their origins are. So when we think of England mm -hmm. and English literature in particular, mm -hmm. let's remember that it's only the 14th, 15th century. Chaucer, mm -hmm. Geoffrey Chaucer, right? We call him the father of English literature. So English literature, when Keats was writing, mm -hmm. is about 400 years old. Right. And if I can put it a little, uh, you know, a little vaguely, not so clearly, how old is Greek literature? How old? You know, we have to go back to Homer. How yes. old is Roman literature? We have to go back to Virgil. So we are going back about 18 plus to about 2000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we are tracing a culture, mm -hmm. a literature, mm -hmm. maybe an inspiration, maybe a source, which is 2000 years old. To you and me, mm -hmm. and to most of us in the 21st century, trying to understand Keats's poetry, mm -hmm. Uh, which is influenced by Hellenism, Hellenism or medievalism or Greek art and culture, I wholeheartedly agree with you mm -hmm. that it's going to be a tough proposition. Right. But when Keats was writing, mm -hmm. I don't think it was so difficult. It, I guess it was widely read at the time. Absolutely. Widely used and widely read. Absolutely. You know, the Elgin marbles, for example. You know, you That's go to a museum, mm -hmm. you see something, and you imagine that everybody would be able to relate. Agreed. I mean, I mean, think of, uh, think of, think of what? Think of Lothal or think of Dolavira, yes, right? So when we think of Gujarat and we think of these places, they are so much a part of our ancient civilization that we would not even ask, what are we talking about? Indus Valley? Yes. Of course it's ours. Mm -hmm. Of course we know what it is about. You know, to Keats it was something like that. Definitely. And that is why this 200 years, you know, after which we are reading Keats, Maybe to some of us, it may seem difficult. But I think, Namita, for our students as well, for, as, well as for us, I think a little more reading would make all, all poetry, yes. right, all literature more interesting. So my dear students, do read about Keats. Do read about the Elgin marbles. Do read about Greek art and literature. Not only because it will get you more marks, but also because it will help you to appreciate what is the, you know, what is the basis, what is the source, all what is, literature. all literature for that matter, but certainly Keats, because uh, Namita, I'm sure you'd agree with me that Keats was um, greatly influenced and inspired by Spencer, right. Spencer, the great Elizabethan poet, yes. having lived so many years ago, mm -hmm. writing, but uh, Keats even sort of experimented with the uh, Spencerian stanza, mm -hmm. you know, which after the Elizabethan, all through the next 200 years, no one did it. No, more than 200, 300 years, nobody did it. Mm -hmm. And then again, Shakespeare, I'm sorry, Keats was trying to imitate what was written in the Elizabethan age. Since we're talking of the Elizabethan age, I think it'll be interesting to tell our students, Namita, also that uh, each age has a special, uh, shall I say, form of poetry. Definitely. When we think of the Elizabethans, we think of sonnets. Yes, yes. When you think of Browning, you know, later, after yes. the Romantic, the Victorian, you immediately think of the dramatic, dramatic monologue, monologue, right? Right. So with uh, Keats, you know, there are certain kinds of poetry, mm -hmm. certain forms, literary mm -hmm. forms, which the sonnet and the ode, mm -hmm. of course, right, being the most important. Uh, another area which is often neglected uh, by us, by us, I mean by teachers and by students and research scholars also probably, uh, with reference to Keats, I think is, Namita, the letters of Keats. 
you know, if you want a running commentary, mm. right? If you want a, want a running commentary of the poems of Keats, you should see the letters that he wrote. You know, then you'd immediately come to know what influenced him, what inspired him, what was his particular experience at that moment. I was staying with this person when I listened to a nightingale. Yes. I saw a nest of a nightingale. You know, when Keats writes this, mm -hmm. it's 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 beautiful. I think we should look at that also in order to be able to. So maybe we could take it to our classroom. Why not? Yes, and tell our students more about the... Uh, uh, all this is what contributes to the greatness of the odes. Definitely. And let's talk about the odes. Imagine most of the odes, uh, Namita, were written in the period of uh, a year, a little more than a year. Mm -hmm. Generally, people talk of 1819 yes. you know, as being the year in which most of the odes were written. His greatest poems, because remember, Endymion got bad reviews. Hyperion was a fragment because no publisher wanted to take the risk of publishing another long poem by Keats. Of course, you have poems like Isabella or The Pot of Basil, inspired by etc. But most of these poems are not read generally by even those of us who love romantic literature. They are read only if they are prescribed, probably, right, in a particular class or course. Can I have the next slide, please? Let us very quickly look at the odes. Ode on indolence, a difficult word, but all of us love to be indolent, I think. Ode to psyche. My dear students, the word psychology, right, should give you some idea of what psyche is about. Ode to a nightingale. Ode on a Grecian on. Ode to Melancholy and Ode to Autumn. I have not really put them in the order in which they were written, but I've put them in some sort of an order because you might like to link up some of these uh, odes, my dear students. You know, they have something in common with each other. Uh, yes, ma'am. Again, I'm interrupting here. No, welcome. Uh, isn't the uh, Ode to a Nightingale a companion piece to Ode on a Grecian Urn? Mm. I think you're absolutely right. Because on one, it's the world of nature. Right. And when Keats talks about dying, mm -hmm. you might very well. Any student might ask us, but the nightingale would die too. Mm -hmm. But remember, the nightingale continues to live on because we are not talking of a specific nightingale. Right. Right. And then when you look at the Grecian urn, we move into the world of art. art. Keats was greatly influenced by the Greek art that he saw. You know, there used to be exhibitions, yes. uh, wandering exhibitions, and he saw, the, um, he saw a lot of Greek art. Mm -hmm. Of course, he traveled too. And when he looked at this, he found that art stays on and on and on. Right? Art is eternal. Right. Life is transient. To imagine that one ode is talking about nature mm -hmm. and one ode is talking about art, art and yet they are, you know, they have to be read together. Because mm -hmm. um, Namita, if you look at these odes, I think you would agree with me that these are his best odes. Definitely. All his odes are good, but even among them, these two odes are the best, best. odes. Uh, we'll talk about them in detail because I think we must discuss them in and detail. Both ma'am are frozen in time. Just as the figures on the urn Absolutely. are frozen in time, so the nightingale, thanks to Keats, Keats is frozen in time. Uh, isn't it interesting that we have such beautiful bird songs, if you can call them that, yes. right? Bird songs, the, the, the color of that we talk about, my dear students. It's, it's such a beautiful word, the color of, you know, mm -hmm. the Gujarati word color of, I think really conveys the chirping, the twittering, the singing of birds. birds. And the birds like the nightingale and the skylark. I'm yeah. thinking of two writers, mm -hmm. uh, contemporaries, romantic poets, one writing on the nightingale and one writing on the skylark. skylark. Not to forget other people who have written. Remember the cuckoo, mm -hmm. to the cuckoo by Wordsworth. Mm -hmm. Think of nightingales by Robert Bridges. Right. You know, you've got poems and poems and poems. We can call them bird songs. What is an ode, my dear students? You do remember that we have looked at different kinds of literary forms. And one of the forms is poetry. And then when you think of poetry, you think of different kinds of poetry. And then you talk of the lyric as a form. And then when you talk of the lyric as a form, you talk of the ode, the sonnet, the song, the idyll, the elegy. 
I'm sure somewhere along the line in your first year, second year or third year, each one of you has heard of the ode as a literary form. What are the chief characteristics of the ode? I'm sure you would recollect that an ode is always a direct address. Remember the figure of speech apostrophe, my dear students? A direct address. Whether it is Shelley singing, Bird though thou never wert, O blight spirit, he says. Right? How does Keats address the Grecian urn? Try and recollect. He calls it a bride, right? He calls it a foster child. He calls it a sylvan historian. All these words are direct address because in an ode, it is always the poet who is directly talking. It could be to a person. It could be to a thing. It could be to a quality. It could be to a creature. But there is always a direct address. What are some of the features of the odes of Keats? There is a contemplation of beauty. There is a love of nature. There is a power of imagination. I think in order to look at these three qualities, my dear students, I think we should once read a few lines. I'm going to read, as I said, from two of the best known odes. Let me begin by reading from Ode to a Nightingale. And remember, when I was talking about sensuousness, those features of his poetry that I talked about, I want to read that verse to you, my dear students. If you have your books with you, look at those lines. And if you don't, please do go back home and look at Ode to a Nightingale, verse number 5. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. But in embalmed darkness, guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket and the fruit tree wild. And then the flowers, my dear students, which we don't know. White hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid-May's eldest child, the coming musk rose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eaves. Such beauty, such subjectivity, such love of nature, such power of imagination is one of the characteristics. When I talk about subjectivity with reference to the odes of Keats, I cannot but read a verse which describes the sorrow that Keats felt. Why did he want to fly away with the nightingale? Because the world here, the mortal world, the world of sorrow, the world of passion, the world where everything is transient is so painful that the only joy that is possible is in flying away with a nightingale. And therefore, he says, I'm reading verse 3 of Ode to a Nightingale. Fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves has never known. And what is it that he knows and the nightingale does not know, my dear students? The weariness, the fever and the fret here, where men sit and hear each other groan. Where palsy shakes a few sad last grey hairs, where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies. Where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. How much of sorrow do you understand why I talk to you about the life of Keats? Why it is important to remember how he had seen both beauty and love? When he talks of beauty, he's thinking of his young brother, right? A brother at 20, between 20 and 25. Gradually tuberculosis just wastes away this young brother. He's talking of new love. Remember, I talked to you about Fanny Brown and how she left him. Where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies. This is the kind of pain and sorrow that Keats had experienced. And therefore, what does he want to do? I cannot but read the next word also, next verse also, where he says, 
away, away, for I'll fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his parts. One way to run away, one way to flee, is to use liquor. But Keats feels, this will not help me. I want something which is more powerful than Bacchus. Bacchus remembers the wine god. Something stronger than that. And what is it? But on the viewless wings of poesy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards. Imagination is of the heart, is of feelings. And you have this brain which keeps pulling you back which says, no, you can't fly away. No, you have to live in this world. And therefore he says, though the brain, dull brain, perplexes and retards, already with thee. Right? He is already with the nightingale. He goes on and on, and then he says at the end of the poem, adieu, adieu. The fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, the plaintive anthem fades, past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now it is buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? Would he love to wake up from this dream? Never. Because the world of the nightingale is far, far superior to the world in which he is forced to live. Next slide, please. The inevitability of death is something that he just cannot escape. Okay. Try as he might, however much he might want to fly away, he cannot. But yet, it is the same Keats, my dear students, who talked about this idea of negative capability. I think that's a very, very interesting thing that he says. Keats himself, to quote him, says, If you really want to write about a sparrow, he says, Namita, mm -hmm. you should be able to peck at the gravel with the sparrow. Mm -hmm. Unless you, you know, uh, you, you are a sparrow. Mm -hmm. Unless you can do what the sparrow does. And you have to imagine the sparrow, you know, that little bird, the chakli which is fast becoming extinct in our towns and cities. You know that little bird pecking at the gravel, mm -hmm. trying to find a worm or a grain. Mm -hmm. You should be able to do that. And this is what he calls negative capability. And I think that's what comes across so beautifully in this in poem, poetry. Ode to a Nightingale. Yes. Talking about Ode to a Nightingale, one cannot but go on to what you so beautifully put as the companion. Right? As a poem that has to go with it. If someone were to ask me which is a better poem, I think I would never be able to answer. There are so many characteristics of the romantic poet that make Ode to a Nightingale such a beautiful poem. Mm -hmm. But Ode to a Grecian Urn is even superior in the sense that he could bring life to a dead object. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the Grecian Urn. And my dear students, I'm sure you know, the urn is a pot in which the ashes of the dead are kept. And what is Grecian? Because it comes from Greek, right? From Greece, and therefore it's Grecian. So it's a Grecian urn. Don't think of those small pots in which we keep water in our kitchen. Think of those huge pots which you might have seen in some museum. You know, in ancient days they used to store um, rice or wheat or whatever for the entire year. You might have seen it in some houses, in some village houses in Gujarat too. Huge containers. And you might have seen it in some exhibitions of Chinese pottery. You know the white and blue color? Mm -hmm. So you have to imagine something of that size right. in order to be able to understand what this Grecian urn is about. And then think of this young Keats standing in front of a Grecian urn. Mm -hmm. Maybe for us to understand it better, my dear students, I might give you an example of a, of a cup, you know, a teacup. And you find the designs on the teacup, right. right? Only thing is you will have to magnify it to the size of an urn. Mm -hmm. So on a teacup, you might find flowers, you know, mm -hmm. a white cup with golden flowers. Yes. Or something a little more imaginative. You have to go on and on with your imagination. Mm -hmm. So here you have the poet Keats, probably standing in front of a Grecian urn. Huge. Think of it as being five feet, six feet, seven feet maybe. Mm -hmm. And also the circumference being very big. Because only then, I'm sure my dear students, Namita, you would agree, that we can then understand the pictures that he is describing. Right. 
you know, it, it, it has to have that uh, three-dimensional effect. You have to be able to go around the urn so that you can see different pictures. The urn, what is it doing? It is telling us a story. All of us believe. You remember, dear students, we used to talk about a pen picture when you had to write a character sketch. Yes. You know, in school, we used to talk of a pen picture. Mm -hmm. It didn't really mean that you took out your pen and pen drew a picture, picture, right? It meant description in words. Right. So we wrote pen pictures. Mm -hmm. In the same way, poetry also does tell us stories. You would agree. Yes. We have got many poems which tell us stories. Uh, we just talked about, for example, the Ancient Mariner mm -hmm. or the Eve of St. Agnes or Christabel. You have poems which are narrative poems. They tell us stories. Now, the Grecian on is also telling us a story. And that is where we have to remember that art tells us much more about history than history books do. What was the kind of life that was lived in ancient Greece? You know, when you look at the urn, you get some idea. So he stands there, he looks at it, and he says, you are a child of foster time. You are a child of silence because you cannot speak. You are a sylvan historian because the, 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 the scenes on, on the urn are all from rural areas and therefore, you know, nature and rural area. So he calls him sylvan historian, calls it sylvan historian. The urn is telling us a story and he's sure that the urn will continue to tell the story much later, even after he is dead and gone. For coming generations, the same thing that he said in O to a Nightingale, mm -hmm. no hungry generations tread thee down. The same thing he says here in the Grecian urn. So he's standing there and looking at the pictures. He is imagining the story that the urn is telling us. See, there are pictures, my dear students, but you should be able to inter interpret them. Mm -hmm. Why is great poetry great even after 200 years, 300 years? Because every generation brings its own interpretation. And that's what we are doing when we look at a poem by Keats or we look at a play by Shakespeare or an essay by Charles Lamb or a novel by Dickens. What do we do? We interpret it depending on the age in which we live. So here is this Grecian urn. He's standing in front of the Grecian urn. And what does he call it? The direct address, the apostrophe, remember, the first characteristic of any ode. So he says, Thou still unravished bride of quietness, Thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian, who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme? Poetry is also trying to tell a story, but he is sure that the urn can tell a story more sweetly than the rhyme. And then, my dear students, there are questions. Questions and questions and questions. Remember another figure of speech that you have come across? A rhetorical question. No answers can be given. No answers are required. What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both? In Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men's or gods are these? What maidens lot? And then he goes on, he goes on, describing what he sees there. And what does he see there? He sees a scene. He sees a scene of people. He sees a hypha. A hypha is a female cow. It is probably being taken to a sacrifice. He sees that. He sees people walking behind. So you have a scene, imagine, of a street where there is a procession. Now if people are there in the procession, my dear students, obviously they are not at home because they are in the procession, which means their houses are empty. I want you to understand the greatness of Keats as a poet. Not only is he describing what he sees there, he is describing what he does not see. Let me repeat that. Here is a procession. So there are people in the procession. Now, if there are people in the procession, their houses are empty. He's imagining, he's imagining what little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk, this pious morn? And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be 
and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can ever return. Can there be greater imagination than this, Namita? To imagine the town that they have left behind, mm -hmm. that town where there'll never be anyone, mm -hmm. right? Because they're always going to be here. And as you said, frozen in time. Mm -hmm. They're going to be frozen in time forever. Is that good or bad? To Keats, it's wonderful. Because, as he had, tells us in the previous verse, which I'll read out now, he tells us that because they are here, they're going to be here forever. Frozen in time, but permanently frozen. They are not going to leave me, Keats is seeming to tell us, mm -hmm. like my parents did. They are not going to leave me the way Fanny, Br Fanny Brown left me. They are not going to leave me the way my brother, who died of tuberculosis, left me. They are going to be here forever. So there is an immortality about the art, which one can never get in life. And therefore he says, ah, I'm reading verse 3, ah, Happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. No autumn here, no winter here, eternal spring. And happy melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new. Because when you look at it, Namita, you think of your favorite song. When I look at it, I think of my favorite song. And my dear students, at your age, you're looking at other songs probably. And therefore, forever piping songs, forever new. Each generation, each viewer, each individual, is going to have a new song. More happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young. All this, according to Keats, is far superior to human experience. All breathing human passion far above, because what happens to human passion, my dear students, according to Keats, that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. This is the kind of sorrow that he experienced. And this is the kind of sorrow that the characters, the figures on the urn will never, never experience. He go um, yes, sorry, yes, Namita. I'm interrupting again. But uh, this also brings out the autobiographical elements in all of Keats's poetry. And Absolutely. Uh, if I may so say so, the, the urn has a painting with a brush, but Keats can paint with words in everywhere that he has uh, brought in all his poetry. We find a kind of painting with a with the uh, brush of words. With a brush of that. words. Absolutely, absolutely. A flowery tale, he says, yes. right? Better than our verse can do. But you're absolutely right. The imagery that Keats creates. That and my dear students, though it's not prescribed, I think you should go and read The Eve of St. Agnes. You know, the, the, the imagery that he creates there, the hall, you almost feel that you are there, you know, enjoying the party and the music. And then when Pofro walks along, you know, it's a beautiful love poem also. Anamita, it's, it's enjoyable. Mm -hmm. When Pofro walks along the corridor, you know, taken by this old lady to Madeline's bedchamber, uh, what is there on the corridor? You know, what, what are these sculptures on the walls? How Keats is able to create it so beautifully that you almost feel, either with your eyes shut or with your eyes open, I think you can walk with Porfiro. Mm -hmm. The imagery is simply superb. The appropriate words, the appropriate colors, you know, the creation. You can, you can imagine those little rosettes. And then he talks when he wants to create that scene of uh, maybe enmity, mm -hmm. of horror, of impending violence, because these two are warring families, you know, Porfiro and Madeline. When he talks about all that, then immediately the kind of pictures that he talks about, the heads that you can see. I'm talking of sculpture, not real right. heads. When he talks about all that, the imagery is so fantastic. And then I agree with you, these are, you know, the brush of an artist, but the words of a poet, poet. Uh, can convey much more. But in order to do that, you need a little imagination. Definitely. You know, there has to be that participation of the reader. But then that was the genius that was known as John Keats. Absolutely, absolutely. And we should be able to appreciate that very well. Read, my dear students, each poem. Read each word. And then you'll understand how beautiful the poem is. I honestly believe, my dear students, that after reading John Keats, you will be able to find more beauty around you. And I think literature gives you that sensitivity to beauty around you. You might ask me, will that get me more marks? No, 
but it'll make your life more muni meaningful. Remember, there's so much of beauty all around us, but we need the eyes to see it. The proverb Namita is absolutely correct. Beauty lies in the eyes, eyes of, of the, the beholder. beholder. What beauty John Keats saw. And remember, my dear students, in a life filled with sorrow and pain and separation and death and mortality, if you could see this, I'm sure we can see so much more. It's monsoon, and I'm sure there's beauty all around us. I did say that there isn't much of philosophy in uh, Keats's poetry, but I think I have to admit that when he says, Thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity. He says, the Grecian urn is forcing you to think. I think there is philosophy there. Not the kind of philosophy maybe that you find in the poems of Wordsworth. Obvious philosophy. But there is certainly some philosophy here. Keats was a fabulous poet. And Namita, one could go on and on and on. Definitely. But can we stop talking about the odes of Keats without mentioning Ode to Autumn? I am not trying to suggest that the other odes, Psyche and Indolence and Melancholy, are not important. But with the constraints of time, I mm -hmm. think one should talk Ode to Autumn. I feel that the Ode to Autumn uh, starts where the others leave off. It is a continuation perhaps of the themes mm -hmm. that the other uh, odes deal with. Uh, the themes of temporal temporality, mortality. Absolutely. Uh, could we then say that it's ideal to conclude with the Ode to Autumn? Why because not? the other odes are over and you say it begins where the others end. Yes. But I think the, the scenes, you know, the imagery and uh, if you have somebody who can really explain the poem or you have the ability to appreciate the poem, my dear students, I think this is the best example of personification. Autumn here is almost a woman and you can see her indifferent. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy stove? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, or on a half-reaped furrow, sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers, and sometimes like a gleaner thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press with patient look thou watchest the last oozings by the hours. Oh, what beautiful scenes of autumn! We don't have autumn, the kind of autumn maybe that England has, but we do have autumn. If you can't think of autumn in terms of shed leaves and bare trees, because we live in the evergreen forest region, but think of the harvest. Think of your golden uh, corn, your makai, your wheat waiting to be cut. Think of the sugarcane fields of Gujarat, and then you can imagine what we are trying to describe. And then all the activities that are associated with autumn. I think it's beautiful. Next slide, please. I just want to show you the kind of handwriting. Maybe a little effort, extra effort would be required. But this is the kind of handwriting. This is George Keats, the elder brother, you know, who has copied a poem by Keats. And this is the beautiful scene of Keats listening to the nightingale. These are just beautiful scenes of nature, Namita, I thought I should put in, because this is the kind of beauty that, that you Keats find. Wrote about. Absolutely. Uh, Ma'am, I find in the right-hand corner, beauty is truth. If we could have the slide, please. Could you kindly explain that to the students? Beauty is truth, truth, truth beauty. beauty. You know, uh, you have this concept of uh, Satyam Shivam Sundaram. Right. It is so much a part of Indian philosophy mm -hmm. that whatever is beautiful has to be true. Uh, whatever is true has to be beautiful. beautiful. And then the philosophy comes across at the end when he says, that is all you know and you need to know. I'm saying you, of course he writes Y-E, which is E. That is all you know and you need to know. And these are taken from the Ode to the Grecian Ode. The last lines of the Ode to the Grecian If you know truth, my dear students, you know beauty. If you know beauty, my dear students, you know truth. How beautifully he sums up the importance of beauty everywhere around us and how important it is for every writer to combine truth and beauty. This is what he does when he concludes the Christian. I'm happy you brought that in because it's such an important part of Keats's poems. At 
think uh, that should conclude, should conclude because of time. And it's important. I think uh, it's, we could discuss cases out individually and uh, we could spend an hour each on each and sheet. And sure. They've been written so beautifully. And uh, it's really sad that Keats himself was not sure, or uh, he was not appreciated rather during his time as uh, he is appreciated today. But um, thank you so much for coming down, ma'am. I think uh, Keats would be understood better, definitely, after today. And uh, if I may, I'd like to conclude in Keats's own words that the beauty of Keats's poetry is a joy of is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases and it will never pass into nothingness. Thank you students for being with us today and we hope that you enjoyed this lecture as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. Thank you once again ma'am. Thank you so much Namita. I enjoyed Keats, one of my favorite poets. Definitely.